There is a God in heaven who rules among men and nations. Jesus Christ is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords, that is a political figure. And in Psalm 2 and in Psalm 110, the Lord lays out what that King, our Lord Jesus, will do to men and nations who rebel against him. I'm Randall Terry. This is Voice of Resistance. Those who forsake the law praise the wicked. Those who uphold the law resist them. Welcome to the Voice of Resistance. Welcome to the program, friend. I use this show to bring to you news, news snippets, but also to bring you an analysis that is rooted in biblical history, biblical law, and hopefully a correct application of biblical history, biblical law, the prophetic books of the Bible, the New Testament, all of that applied to the news to kind of get a sense of where we are and where we're going. If you don't know where you came from, if you don't know history, and be able to see where you were and where you are, you don't have the ability to chart a course. You understand? If, if you're just here, where am I going? Well, wait, if, if I know I was here when I started, I'm going this way. If you're on your way to the moon and you're off by one or two percent, mm, you're gonna end up in outer space. So I certainly don't claim to have a perfect gyroscope and a perfect navigational system. But I promise you that my intent and my history and my experience as a broadcaster and as a preacher is to equip the saints of God for what is going on now and what is coming. And there are things coming. So you can look at the news right now. Biden has done more executive orders than the three presidents combined times three. They're now talking about D.C. statehood. They are now talking about packing the Supreme Court. Now, and by that, they've started a commission to talk about expanding the number of members on the Supreme Court to 10 or 11 or 12. So in this segment, I'm going to talk about that, the why. But then in the next segments, we're going to talk about the why of God. There's the why of man, and then there's the why of God. When Nebuchadnezzar took Jerusalem, he had an idea in his head why he was doing it. But God had an idea. God had a plan. God had a purpose. And it was the overarching purpose and will of God that was the most important thing for the Jews of that day. God dealt with Nebuchadnezzar in his time but I'm getting ahead of myself. Why DC statehood? Why Puerto Rican statehood? Do you know? This is really critical, friends. So right now you've got Biden working to figure out a way to give illegal immigrants citizen status, which means that they could do what? Vote. You have the discussions of DC statehood there will be a discussion coming up very shortly of Puerto Rican statehood. Why? The answer is very simple. The Democrats want to control the Senate and they want to control the White House. It's hard for them to control the House. The House was designed by our founders to be able to flip. It's the people's house. Every two years an election, if your US House member ticks you off, don't worry. There's gonna be an election right around the corner. You can throw his butt out. The Senate is not that way. And the Senate is needed to pass legislation. The Senate is needed to confirm judges to the Supreme Court, needed to confirm judges at every level of the federal judiciary. The Senate is a critical part of the three branches of government, the presidency, the Congress, which is made up of the House and the Senate, and then the, ju the judiciary. The Senate impacts both, not just the legislature, but it impacts the judiciary because they get to confirm the, the courts, the judges, and 
they impact the presidency because <clears throat> if they don't vote for a bill to be passed, for a law to be passed that the president wants, the president is out of luck. All right, so DC statehood is simply a matter of math. There's a shadow congresswoman who has been there. Actually, I have to check and see if she's still in, but she has been there forever. She gets to sit on committees, but she has no right to vote on a bill on the floor, all right? She wins every time. That shadow Congress person wins with a 90% margin every election. Washington, D.C., the actual real estate is made up of 85 to 90% Democrats. So if they grant Washington, D.C. statehood, contrary to the Constitution, they get two senators. Every state has two U.S. senators. So let's say that tomorrow we woke up and D.C. had statehood. They would have special elections. They would elect Jesse Jackson to one U.S. Senate seat and take your pick for the other, Maxine Waters, whoever. Now, suddenly, instead of 100 members in the Senate, you've got 102. And instead of the 50-50 split that we are experiencing today, it's 52-50. Now the Democrats control the Senate. They don't even need the vice president to vote. And then picture if 11 million illegal, illegal immigrants are granted amnesty. All of the polling data shows, and they have polled these Ill illegal immigrants, all of the polling data shows that 80% of them will register as Democrats. So if there's one and a half million illegal immigrants in Texas, that would mean that 1.2 million of them would register as Democrats. And that margin, those new Democrats coming in to the Democrat Party in Texas, that margin would mean that Ted Cruz could never win a Senate seat again. You Ted Cruz fan? This is a way of ensuring that Ted Cruz is gone. Did you see how tight the races were in Florida? Do you like Marco Rubio? If illegal immigrants are given voting status, Marco Rubio is in his last term. He's done. They know where the population of illegal immigrants live. Florida, Texas, Arizona, Colorado. There's a bunch in Ohio. So DC statehood and granting illegal immigrant status to, or rather granting voting status, citizenship to 11 million immigrants would result in the Senate being irrevocably lost. And it might even give the Democrats the threshold that they need to have a supermajority, where they don't have to worry about filibuster, they don't have to worry about cloture, these rules that are set in place to slow the Senate down. And then what? I'm gonna take a quick break. When we come back, no, I'll finish it and then I'm gonna go on to what God thinks. And then they control the Supreme Court. Then they control the presidency. Think this through with me. The presidency is won by the Electoral College and it's based upon the population and the number of House seats that are and Senate seats that are in any given state. So not only would the Democrats pick up the Senate seats in Florida and in Texas and in Arizona, they would pick up the delegates for the, for the presidency, for the Electoral College. Then the pathway to the presidency for a Republican is over. It's done. And then what? Then they control who gets on the Supreme Court, who gets in the federal judiciary, and they can ram their agenda down the throat of the American people, and there will be literally nothing that we can do to stop it. Zero. That's what they're after. And they are moving at lightning speed, and they are not playing around. So I want to thank with contempt. This is, this is both a joke and a rebuke. I want to thank all of the Christians 
evangelical Roman Catholic who voted for Joe Biden to give us this godlessness. I want to thank all the Georgian Christians who stayed home and didn't vote in the, se- the, the special election so that two Democrats could take those seats that should have been easily won by Republicans. I want to thank all of the bishops, priests, preachers, evangelical superstars who sat on their hands and did and said nothing publicly before this election because you are the reason that we have what's going on right now. I want to thank all the people watching this program who aren't even registered to vote. You didn't vote. And your absence from the voting booth is in part responsible for what we are enduring as a nation. God grant me the courage I'm sorry, God grant, how does it go? The serenity prayer. God grant me the courage to, um, no, uh, I'll be right back. Because there's courage and there's acceptance and then there's wisdom. I always get that prayer messed up, but I'll have it right when we come back. Don't go away. Welcome back, friend. I've got it. It's the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Most of us, well, let me put it to you like this. That prayer does not apply, or at least it didn't apply to American politics. It might apply soon. But we had the ability to stop what is going on. The Christian community had the ability. There are 75%, 74% of the people in this country have a Trinitarian baptism and profess faith in Jesus Christ. Tens of millions of people voted for Biden. Tens of millions of people stayed home, didn't vote at all. So we had the ability. This is... That was certainly not the time for the serenity prayer. Well, there's nothing I can do. Get off of your butt and fight. Really? Nothing you can do? Are you kidding? (laughs) What a joke. But now there might be nothing we can do. Now it might be too late. So let's talk about Nebuchadnezzar. Let's talk about Nebuchadnezzar's will and then the mind of God. When Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army came to take Jerusalem, or when the Midianites came, in the days of Gideon, okay? They had an agenda. The Midianites came, and they came in like locusts every year. And what did they do? They fed their army. They had an agenda. They wanted livestock. They wanted grain. They wanted grapes. They wanted food. Whatever they could steal from the people, okay? They had an agenda. When the Philistines took away all of the swords from the Jews before the days of King Saul and Jonathan, followed by King David, the Philistines had an agenda. They wanted to disarm the Jews so that they could oppress them. The Midianites just wanted food. Nebuchadnezzar wanted obedience and tribute. So these evil pagan rulers that were oppressing the people of God had an agenda, but God had an agenda. God's agenda was to chasten his people, to bring chastisement, to bring judgment on them. Oh, Rito, God doesn't judge his people. Yeah, Peter said judgment begins at the house of God. Well, Well, the New Testament, yeah, Peter's in the New Testament. Peter is referring to Ezekiel chapter 9. We covered that in a show earlier. If you didn't see it, I encourage you to go to my YouTube channel and watch it. It'd be a good Bible study for you. Judgment begins at the house of God. That is a New Testament principle. And we are the house of God. We are his body. We are the church. We are the temple of the living God. Judgment begins with us. So Nebuchadnezzar, the Midianites, the Philistines, they have an agenda. But God has an agenda behind them. God is using those wicked leaders, those wicked armies, to wake and shake, or shake and wake his people, to bring his people to repentance. Repentance for what? Well, 
read the book of Judges. Read the book of Jeremiah. You can see for yourself. I mean, if, if you read Exodus and read the laws of Moses, there are things that God specifically said will result in the nation being occupied by enemy forces. Literally, God said, look, here's how this is. Here's my commandments. Obey me. Build your house. Every man have a vineyard and sit in the shade of your vineyard. You have lots of children. You can be blessed. Just serve me. Obey me. Obey my commands. And it'll go well with you. Now, if you don't do this and you adopt the practices of the pagan nations that are around you, if you kill your children, if you have men lie with men as if they were women, if you commit these abominations, if you offer sacrifices to the host of heaven and you worship pagan idols, God says, don't do that because if you do, just like I punished the nations that were in the Middle East, in the promised land, just like I punished them before you came and took it over, I'll punish you. So here we are, the United States of America, and we're witnessing the speedy loss of our country. It's like the Jews did. Now I say speedy, I mean, it's not gonna happen today. It might take six months, it might take two years. Just like with the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, it, you know, they had the city in siege for a while. With, with Gideon, there was seven years of occupation. So when we look back and we read about what Nebuchadnezzar did, it feels truncated to us. It feels short. Two years and 730 days or whatever it is, right? It's fast. Two years in a lifespan of human beings, pretty quick. So we're, wa we're watching this country be overrun by pagan evildoers who have an agenda like Nebuchadnezzar in the Midianites. But remember, God has an agenda behind them. Judgment begins at the house of God. I'll be right back. God, grant me the serenity to accept what I can't change, the courage to change what I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. All right, so what do we do? I'm going to be talking about this a lot over the next couple of years because part of the message is going to be there's nothing we can do, people. And part of it is going to be, there is something we can do, people, and we've got to fight, and here's how and where. Sorry, that's just what it is. In other words, when Gideon was part of the, the Jews that were being victimized by the Midianites, what did he do? He got all the wheat and hid it in a wine press, all right? So he's below the surface, and he's threshing wheat in the wine press. You don't thresh wheat in a wine press because you need wind, so he's down in this wine press throwing the wheat up and all the chaff is just sprinkling down on him because <laughs> there's no wind down inside. But he was trying to save his family. He was trying to have food. So he's praying, oh God, why is this happening to us? Where are all your miracles? Where We heard about what you did with the Egyptians and you brought us out of the land of Egypt. Meanwhile, this is the craziness of it. Meanwhile, in Gideon's dad's front yard, okay? So they've got a farm of some kind would have been, you know, fairly spacious. But literally in the front yard is an idol, a pagan idol. So Gideon, this is how crazy people can get. Gideon is a hero in the scriptures, right? But he's sitting there threshing, we going, oh God, why is this happening to us? You, from our distance, you could say, what are you, a moron? <laughs> you got an idol in the front yard. The Jews are worshiping pagan idols and God's chastening you. Are you kidding me? What's going on? And so before God let him deliver the nation of Israel and before God gave him the strength and grace to defeat the Midianites, God said, oh, by the way, we've got one small issue we've got to deal with. Yeah, it's that idol in your dad's front yard. You need to get rid of it. I'll be right back. So what did Gideon have to do? He had to destroy the idol. That was it. And he was so afraid, he did it by night. And he took 10 of his dad's servants and came and they toppled it. It was big. And then they chucked it up. They beat it up with axes and then they burned it. And they sacrificed a bull on the ashes of that pagan idol to the Lord. So what are our idols? 
I mean, what are the idols that we have? I can tell you for sure, this is gonna hurt, this is gonna sting, I'm letting you know ahead of time. One of the greatest idols, biggest, worst idols in the American church today is the love of self. We have built schools of theology around the love of self, the faith movement. God wants you happy. God wants you wealthy. God wants you everything to go great for you. Just claim it, name it, rebuke the devil. Entire schools of theology that are a fantasy. Meanwhile, we pamper ourselves, forgetting the words of our Lord Jesus. If any man wants to be my disciple, let him take up his cross daily and follow me. Taking up your cross means dying to yourself. The love of our reputation, the love of our comfort, the love of me, 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 is perhaps the greatest idol that we have in this country. And until that idol is torn down, people, I think we're in for a season of hardship. Just start threshing wheat in your wine press. I'll see you soon.